All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Gary Tobbs is an investigative science and health journalist, and arguably the most popular of our time. He's the author of The Case Against Sugar, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, and Good Calories, Bad Calories. He graduated from Harvard College in 1977 with a degree in applied physics. He received a master's degree in engineering from Stanford University and a master's in journalism from Columbia University. His newest book is called The Case for Keto. It's a great read, and we're gonna go into it in today's conversation. Gary, welcome to the show. I've been following your work since Good Calories, Bad Calories, which led me to an article that you wrote, The Soft Science of Dietary Fat, and I've been a fan ever since. I'd love for you to take me back to the beginning for you. We, before the show started, you talked about living in Venice, being in LA, with, where, where I live, and, um, and I'd just love to know what led you down the path to becoming a journalist in, in the health space? What pulled you into that? I had a science background in college. I went to journalism school. The only job I could get was in science journalism. So because I had the science background, I became a science journalist. This is a long, long time ago in the 1980s. By chance, my first book ended up being about a group of uh, very brilliant physicists who discovered non-existent fundamental particles. And, and the non-technical term would be they screwed up. <laughs> while I was embedding, embedded with them, living at this laboratory. So my first book and then my next book were both about bad science. They were about how easy it is to make mistakes in science and how hard it is to get the right answer and how these sort of pathologies manifest themselves in science. And uh, when I was done with the second book, which was called Bad Science, my friends in the physics community said, if you're interested in bad science, you should look at the stuff in public health because it's really pretty terrible. So I moved into public health in the early to mid 90s. I did a series of investigative articles for the journal Science. It slowly, by the third of these articles, I was now writing about nutrition, salt, and blood pressure, and then the article you read, Dietary Fat and Heart Disease. And I spent, these were lengthy investigations. The first one took me nine months. The second one took me a year. Um, the basically going back in history to interrogate the evidence base of these beliefs that we had all grown up believing that I had, you know, my diet, I lived in LA at the time. I was eating a low fat, low salt diet because I thought that was the ticket to health. That's what we were being told. That's the public health guidelines. And what I learned was that 
the nutrition, obesity, chronic disease research community really has a different conception of how to do science than do hard scientists. And unfortunately, the conception the hard scientists have is probably the necessary conception, which is your hypotheses have to be rigorously tested and rigorously and rigorously and meticulously and repetitively tested before you want to go and believe anything. And in nutrition and chronic disease research, it's so hard to test your hypotheses. You have an idea like dietary fat causes heart disease. Uh, if you want to test it, you know, heart disease takes years to decades to develop and not everyone gets it, even if they eat high fat diets, if your hypothesis is right. So the tests are very expensive. They take years to decades to do. And by very expensive, I mean tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars. They require thousands to tens of thousands of subjects. And even when you do them, you can't count on having gotten the right answer because they're so easy to screw up. So the nutrition and chronic disease research community just decided they didn't have to do them. And in effect, they could believe their hypotheses. And just to compare this with how harder scientists think about science, the uh, uh, Nobel laureate physicist Richard Feynman, who's kind of a folk hero in modern times, Feynman said, the first principle of science is you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. And in nutrition and chronic disease research, they decided we could kind of trust our own judgment because how could we possibly be wrong? <laughs> and then they communicate the public health guidelines to everyone. So they, they decide they're likely enough to be right that they can tell us all to act on it. And we do. It's a, also the complete opposite of sort of the Hippocratic Oath in medicine where the first principles do no harm, right? Right. Here it's like, well, we're so confident we're going to help you that we're just going to trust we're going to do no harm. So that was sort of the gist of it. Um, 2002, I published this New York Times Magazine story that was called What If It's All Been a Big Fat Lie? It was a cover of the New York Times Magazine. It was on the, the obesity epidemic and obesity and the idea that once again that the nutrition, chronic disease, the obesity research community had just screwed up just gotten the wrong answer. Uh, it was an infamous story. It got me a large book advance, enough to spend four years of my life doing good calories, bad calories, which then took me five years, which is kind of a, a uh, problem in, in this kind of journalism. Um, and uh, yeah, and since then I haven't been able to get out. So the, I've been depending on how you look at it, I've either been unpacking the research I did for good calories, bad calories, and, and uh, figuring out different ways to communicate it, or in, like right now I'm working on a book on diabetes and diet, which takes a chapter from, you know, or a few chapters from good calories, bad calories, and really, you know, opens them up and looks into them in much greater depth and what kind of mistakes have been made. And I like to think every book I've done is basically about good science and bad science, which is my obsession, but they have very profound implications for how we should eat and why we get sick and have helped to catalyze this revolution of which you're a part. And, um, you know, it's been an interesting run. I, I love that you're obsessed with good science and bad science because unfortunately it feels like the bad science, like you said, is coming down at us as guidelines of how we should be eating. And I'd like to unpack that a little bit. What's some of the bad science that you think we're getting wrong that you're clearing up in your, in your books and even in your most recent book, The Case for Keto? Open question whether I'm clearing it up. I'm trying to clear it up. <laughs> um, the obvious one is that we get facts we eat too much. I guess there are, there are the modern nutrition thinking is based on four pillars, three or four. Let's see what we come up with. The first one, the fundamental one that's, that's even the researchers don't even realize that, that what they're doing is based on this. It's based on this idea that you get fat because you're taking more calories than you expend. So obesity is an energy balance disorder, and then all the disorders that associate with obesity, heart disease, diabetes, uh, hypertension, strokes, cerebrovascular disease, all of these are 
you know, in part caused by obesity, which is caused by taking, eating too much. It's the simplest way to put it. Um, uh, dietary fat, another pillar is this idea that dietary fat causes heart disease. So since the 1960s, 70s, all our dietary advice has to uh, be reconcilable with this idea that you have to eat a low fat diet. The problem is if obesity is not caused by eating too much, if it's a hormonal disorder as, you know, obese, in people who suffer from obesity used to argue, then the hormone dominating fat accumulation is insulin and we secrete insulin primarily in response to the carbohydrates in our diet. And until the 1960s, when this dietary fat causes heart disease thing came along, the kind of conventional thinking, you know, uh, mother's wisdom was that carbohydrates make you fat. And so one of the arguments I make in my book is by 1960s, we actually worked out the mechanisms via which carbohydrates should make us fat. And then it's kind of tossed because instead we embrace this idea that dietary fat causes heart disease. If it does, then you have to eat low fat diets and then you replace fat with carbohydrates. And since heart disease associates with obesity, carbohydrates can't make you fat by that thinking. So you know, uh, 150 years of sort of conventional wisdom is tossed out the door so that we can buy this idea that we get fat, we get heart disease from dietary fat. And the third pillar is also based on this idea of, that comes out of the dietary fat story, but it's basically that, that, that the healthiest diet is plant-based. And this is an outcome of first of the idea, if you want to lower the fat content to your diet, it's easier to do that by eating plant foods than animal foods, animal products. And then this whole science of epidemiology, risk factor epidemiology, which began to emerge in the 1950s uh, and sort of became a full-fledged science by the 1970s or a full-fledged area of research by the 1970s. And the people who did this research never sort of embraced the kind of critical, rigorous testing of their own methods that are necessary in harder sciences to make progress. So you end up with this field of research where they take surveys of populations, simplest way to think of it, and then they follow the populations in time to see who gets sick and who doesn't, and then they look at what they eat or what they ate when they started the survey, and they say, well, the people who remain healthy ate this, and the people who got sick tended to eat that, and therefore that causes sickness, and this associates with health. And what they get is an association between what you eat and health, but they have no causal information on in that association. They don't know that what you eat causes a good health, and we could talk about that endlessly. That was a cover story I did for the New York Times Magazine in 2007, when good calories, bad calories came down. So obesity is caused by eating too much. A healthy diet is a low fat or a low saturated fat diet, and a mostly plant diet is the healthiest way to eat. Those are sort of the three pillars of modern nutrition research, and I think they're all wrong. You preach into the choir. <laughs> and clearly we're a minority opinion. So right. part of the challenge, my challenge as a journalist is to remain credible and continue to chip away at the consensus such that maybe 10 or another 20 years from now, most of what we believe, if it's right, will be, have become consensus thinking among the, you know, the experts right. whose expertise I've questioned. I mean, it's amazing to me to look back and think that maybe my grandma knew that carbohydrates caused high blood sugar, caused her, you know, her waistline to get bigger and naturally went back to plants, a little bit of protein and, you know, movement called good quality sleep and knew that that got her back to where she wanted to be. Obviously we've made a huge departure from that. People were very afraid of saturated fat. So they go away from animal proteins and they make that association to heart disease. What have you found? Is there, is there any credible research in the sort of, I want to say paleo or keto space, you obviously made a case for keto. So let's start to unpack that. Like, what were you able to uncover in your research for that book? Well, so, you know, we talk about the idea that obesity is caused by eating too much. Um, 
And this was an idea. So until 1930, and again, one of the advantages of looking at the history is you then understand why we believe what we believe. And I think you can speak in an informed way about it. But until 1930, there were basically two theories of obesity. One was that people eat too much. I'm going to use sort of simplified yeah. you know, uh, uh, politically incorrect language in this discussion, because that's how they thought of it back then. Uh, and I apologize for anyone, to anyone it offends. But the idea was, you know, fat people eat too much, they're gluttons, they're slothful. That was one, I'd, I'd say most doctors probably assume that to be true on some level. And the other idea was it's a hormonal disorder. And, you know, people who are predisposed to get fat are going to do so pretty much independent of how much they eat. They can starve themselves and prevent the fat from accumulating to some extent, but then they're gonna be hungry, you know, starving all the time. So that was a sort of hormonal physiological uh, researcher comes along in 1930 named Lewis Newberg, and he says he tests these two hypotheses on seven people and proves definitively that we eat too much, fat people eat too much, end of story. All fat people eat too much, um, he bases it in part on this typical sort of misperception about what the laws of thermodynamics say. You know, the law, of, first law of thermodynamics, which is called the energy balance law, is that if you're gaining body mass, if your body mass is increasing, then you're taking in more energy than you expend. It basically says these are two ways of saying the same thing. If you're getting fatter and heavier, body mass is increasing, then you're also taking in more energy than you expend. It doesn't say that one causes the other, but since Newberg onward, or actually since a guy named von Norden, a German onward, it's been assumed that taking in more energy than you expend is the cause of obesity. And I, when I argue with people on Twitter, which I try not to do, but I get <laughs> sucked in, I say, look, there's an equal sign there, dude. Speaking like- yeah. Friends in Venice used to speak. You know, it doesn't say there's not an arrow of causality. There's an equal. It says these two ways of saying something are equivalent. So anyway, Newberg assumes that it's in, in the late 1930s, for the first time ever, researchers have animal models of obesity. So once you have animal models, you can actually do experiments. And one researcher, a guy named John Brobeck, uh, postdoc at Yale, he's in medical school with his, he has his PhD. Now he's gone back to Yale during the war to go to medical school. He does these experiments on mice and he says, look, I cause obesity in these mice and they're crazy hungry and they eat voluminous amounts of food. And he says, therefore they get fat because they eat voluminous amounts of food. And from then onward, the conventional wisdom of obesity is we get fat because we eat too much. There's no critical thinking going on at all in this period. Right. I mean, it's bizarre, but when you go back and look, it's just people see something and decide that what they see causes something else they see. By the 1960s, researchers, beginning in the 1930s, researchers begin to have the tools they need to understand the hormonal regulation of fat accumulation. Okay, you need the right tools to do this. Uh, one tool is created in the mid-30s, two others in 1956 and 1960s. And by the 1960s, they could work it out. And they learned that all hormones have some effect on fat accumulation. Virtually all of them stimulate fat accumulation. Fat, they stimulate your fat to release fat into the circulation because they're telling your body to do something. You know, the classic example is flea or, you know, adrenaline. Is this fight or flight. Fight, flight or fight hormone? Thank you. Yeah. And if you're going to flee, flee or fight, you need fuel to do it. Like you don't want to be confronted with a lion only having enough fuel in your body to run 20 feet because a lion's going to catch you. You got to be able to outrun the lion. So the adrenaline tells your fat tissue to dump fat into the bloodstream and also tells your liver to dump any stored glycogen, which are carbs, and now you can run. The only hormone that really works to store calories in fat and inhibit their release is insulin. Okay, so this is clearly worked out by the 1960s. The mechanisms by which it does it are mostly worked out. There's a system that's worked out called the, the glucose fatty acid cycle. So the idea is we eat a mixed meal, we store fat, 
insulin, well, we eat, eat, eat a mixed meal. The insulin, the carbs stimulate insulin secretion. The carbs get into the circulation, blood sugar starts going up. I should say the rise in blood sugar stimulates insulin secretion. And now the insulin tells your fat to hold on to the fat. So all the fat you eat is stored, which is true. We store the fat we eat while the body is dealing with this rising blood sugar because high blood sugar is toxic. So the insulin is also telling your cells, take up blood sugar and burn it. Like they'll do it anyway, but the insulin's you know, sort of kicks them into high gear. So now your muscle cells and your organs are burning blood sugar furiously to keep the tide from continuing to rise. And as blood sugar finally starts to come down and insulin starts to come down, the fat cells start to see what this Rosalind Yalom and Solomon Burst, and they invented the primary tool necessary to do this research. Um, Yalom won the Nobel Prize for it. Burson had died by then. So it's called the radio immunoassay. It allowed you to measure insulin in the bloodstream for the first time, any hormones in the bloodstream. And as insulin comes down, the Alan Burson said, the fat cells see what's the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency, and they release fat into the bloodstream. So insulin basically traps fat in your fat cells. And the other thing Alan Burson observe once they had this tool available was that people who suffer from obesity tend to be insulin resistant. So that means that their muscle cells don't respond properly to insulin and their pancreas responds to this by pumping out more and more insulin to take care of the blood sugar and so their insulin levels are elevated all day long. Their fat cells never really see this negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. So their fat is accumulating fat all day long. And Yalom and Burson said, look, we always think of obesity leading to diabetes, but maybe a little bit of diabetes, which is this insulin resistance, causes the obesity. Because insulin, they said, is the most lipogenic hormone. It's the hormone that makes your body store fat and hold on to it. And all of this gets worked out and it all gets thrown out because we decide that dietary fat causes heart disease and because a lot of researchers, thin researchers, know in their heart of hearts that obesity is caused by eating too much. In fact, by the 1960s, when all this is happening, obesity research has become a subdiscipline of psychology and psychiatry. The major figures in the field are psychiatrists, the major advances in the field are all these people trying to figure out why fat people eat too much because they believe that's been demonstrated and it hasn't. So there's this amazing story that I don't even, you know, I've done all the research, I could lay it out, I've written books on it, articles on it, I still find it hard to believe. And anyone should be skeptical of this, somebody like me. But beginning in 1930, the obesity research community jumped on the wrong hypothesis because it fit their preconceptions that fat people eat too much. So they had some researcher come along and say, I've proven that fat people eat too much with my experiments, which sounds very scientific. It wasn't when you look at what he did. And once the mouse models were interpreted as people eating too much, as the mice eating too much, everything that followed was interpreted like that. And that's even today when you read research articles about the cause of obesity, it's researchers trying to explain why fat people might eat too much. Well, it is really, I mean, I will say like in having a private practice for almost a decade, if I were to sit down with clients and say, well, your resting metabolic rate is this and I need you to keep your calories below this, the actionability of that is really hard for clients versus understanding, starting to understand how to balance their blood sugar so that they aren't in a hyperinsulinemic state and that they right. are in the ability to use the food that they're eating for fuel between meals, not have to snack all day long. And it does tend to lean itself towards food that lasts in your body without that major insulin spike and blood sugar roller coaster. But when people don't understand the science, calories is the easiest way to start making change in their day. They don't feel like they no. have to really understand it. So I love that you just unpack that. Well, that's what I figure, if nothing else, I want the physicians to understand. And this is part of the revolution that I mentioned and that I discuss in the case for keto. 
When I started this research, there were maybe half a dozen doctors in the country, by my estimate, that I could find who were prescribing low-carb, high-fat diets to their patients or ketogenic diets, and half of those had written books, you know, Mike and Mary Dan Eads, who wrote Protein Powder and Power, and uh, Atkins, of course, and these guys from Tulane University who wrote Sugar Busters and even to some extent, the zone capitalized on this idea that this is not an eating too much problem. It's a hormonal problem, which have to do with lower insulin and maybe lower insulin and raise this hormone glucagon, which is a counter regulatory hormone. So glucagon works against insulin. And when you eat carbs, you raise insulin and you depress glucagon, which is the exact opposite of what you want to do. Uh, when you eat protein, you raise insulin a little, but you also raise glucagon and your body secretes growth hormone in response because it, your body wants to use a protein to rebuild muscles and tissues. It doesn't want to burn it for energy if it doesn't have to. So the hormonal cocktail that comes out is evolved to use protein to rebuild muscle and tissue, store fat, burn carbs, that sort of what you want to do. And the problem is, is our diet switch to a lot of high glycemic index refined carbs and sugars. We basically created a diet that tells our body to store fat and keep it stored. And then once mothers eat that diet and get pregnant and give birth, they give birth to kids who are now sort of evolved to, in theory, deal with that kind of hormonal milieu and they're predisposed to get obese and diabetic and then you get gets worse with each generation and we're now in you know generation 10 or so a lot of people struggling to deal with something that might be certainly beyond their conscious control unless they do something like keto and even that might have limited efficacy for many of them we don't wow. know how many Let's let's talk about that. I'd love I'd love to unpack decreasing insulin and raising glucagon. You mentioned eating protein and obviously eating a ketogenic diet. You know, it's not going to work for everybody, but I would love to understand the mechanism mechanisms of action when someone goes keto. Is there a clean and healthy way to do that? What are you seeing that is working for people and what have you seen in the research from keto and how it's creating an anti-inflammatory environment and allowing for fat loss. So the idea is, again, we talked about, I mentioned the Alan Burson talking about this negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. So insulin, one of the primary effects it has on fat cells is to inhibit this process by which fat is broken down into its component molecules, fatty acids, and then released into the bloodstream so it could be burned for fuel. So we store fat as something called a triglyceride, which is three fatty acids bound together by a glycerol molecule, which is a carbohydrate. And we release it into the bloodstream. We traffic the fat as fatty acids around the bloodstream, and they're burned for fuel as fatty acids. So one of the key aspects in all this is you have to, once I told you all the fat we eat, most of the fat we eat gets stored immediately. So it gets bundle onto these lipoprotein particles called chylomicrons and it gets they go around the body and they deliver fat in the form of fatty acids to the fat cells and then the fatty acids go into the cells and they're bound together as triglycerides and the triglycerides are too big to get out i used to tell this story when i lectured and had more time about when when my son was about uh, two years old we wanted to get him out of his crib and we bought a bed from ikea that I had to put together and I had, you know, um, uh, drawers under it. It was this big, and it was a Sunday. So I wanted to watch a football game while I put it together. So I put it together in the living room and realized it was too big to get it through into the bedroom. <laughs> oh, no. So you have to take it apart and take it through in pieces and then put it back together again. And then you just, when we moved, we left it in the bedroom for the next owners, you know, <laughs> hoping they didn't mind. That's basically what your body does with fat. It, chylomicrons actually have triglycerides in them. They bring the triglycerides to the fat cell and there's this enzyme called lipoprotein lipase that reaches into the bloodstream, breaks down the triglycerides as fatty acids. They go through the door because they can fit. And then it puts it 
the, the enzymes that put the fatty acids back together as a triglyceride on the other side where they're too big to get out. So as long as they're too big to get out, you're going to continue accumulating fat in your fat cells. And then there's this pro other enzymes that there are to break it down and back into fatty acids so you could get it out and you don't have to leave it for the next donor. Um, insulin inhibits that breakdown of fatty acids that was it does so when insulin is elevated it keeps fat in fat cells and to uninhibited you the fat cells have to see this negative signal of insulin deficiency and as it turns out those are very low levels of insulin what would be the range uh, it's hard to say because it's probably different for everyone okay so for those of us who are naturally lean, it's probably very high, right? You know, you, you're spending most of your time in this area where you, your body doesn't want to trap fat. It wants to keep it coming out. It might go in, but it just continues to come right out of the fat cells. For those of us, the heavier we are, chances are the lower that threshold is, but it's very much clearly a threshold. And by that, when I was doing my research for this book and I was interviewing people, first good calories, bad calories, they would talk about the researchers who studied fat met cell metabolism would use this phrase, the exquisite sensitivity of fat cells to insulin. So what they meant is even when insulin is barely secreted at all, the fat cells detect it and this lipolysis process is shut down. So if you really want to get fat out of your fat cells, you have to basically minimize insulin. You don't know if you, how, well, you'll probably get below this threshold. You don't know how much of the day you'll be below the threshold. Because the longer you're below the threshold, the more insulin you'll, the more fat you'll mobilize. But you know that you got to minimize it. A ketogenic diet is basically a diet that minimizes insulin secretion. Maybe a carnivore diet does it really minimizes it, and the ketogenic diet is a compromise. But um, you're getting rid of all the garbage foods that stimulate insulin. You're getting rid of all the sugars that might, I think, cause this condition, insulin resistance, fundamentally. And you're replacing them primarily with fat, which is the one macronutrient that doesn't stimulate insulin secretion. So even though the more fat you eat, the more fat at some point in the day you will store. This is one of the mistakes that were made. Researchers, when they realize that the fat we eat is the fat we store, naturally thought, well, if we eat less fat, we'll store less fat. But what they didn't realize is that the fat we eat is the fat we store, but the amount of fat we can we, we keep in storage is regulated by the carbohydrates we eat. Like our bodies aren't that simplistic. There's a much more complex, interesting things going on. And so the carbs keep the fat stored. If you remove them all, you'll maximize how much of the day you're mobilizing fat rather than storing it. And you'll minimize, you know, basically do the best job I think you can through diet to you know, get achieve and maintain a healthy diet. That was a love, long way of answering whatever your initial question. <laughs> I love it. No, we want to plummet those insulin levels yeah. to get, even if we are eating a higher fat diet, to make sure that we're mobilizing and oxidizing those fatty right. acids instead of storing them for the long haul. Right. So, right. without I, making an assumption, but like a high processed high carbohydrate and high fat diet sounds like a cocktail for diabetes. Uh, yeah, and obesity, yeah. So, which is basically what, um, you know, what happened to this country and the, I would argue until probably the 1960s, we ate a high fat diet, but the carbs we ate, nobody was being told that they should eat a low fat, higher carb diet for weight loss. And then when you look at the sugar story with my last book before the case for keto was a case against sugar. The way we consume sugar changed dramatically and well, it's a long story, but basically the 1950s and 1960s were the years in which, um, for instance, desserts for children, uh, breakfast for children became the equivalent of like a low fat version of dessert. So sugary cereals came in and suddenly and fruit juices came in sort of post World War II and suddenly we were having as much sugar for breakfast as you might typically have for dessert once a week prior to that. And I think that's 
probably one of the major drivers of then the obesity epidemic, which you start to see emerge 20 years later as these kids eat adulthood, reach adulthood. Yeah, the, the key ultimately to me is, you know, on one level is this thing where you just, you have to lower insulin. And again, the way, the primary way you do that is place the carbohydrates with fat, not necessarily with protein, because a significant amount of the amino acids and protein are converted to glucose, raise blood sugar, and stimulate insulin. Like I said, they also stimulate glucagon and growth hormone. Can we make a comparison there? Because you mentioned the carnivore diet, which for people right. listening is eating only mostly red meat. And I think you can get away with some egg yolks and versus a ketogenic diet. Uh, are there are there mistakes that you see people making on the ketogenic diet with too much protein? Or because you mentioned that the carnivore diet would, would do a better job. Can you explain the differences and uh, mechanisms well, of so, that? Uh, the ketogenic Keto, which, you know, when I was young, it was Atkins. Right. When Phase Atkins one, was, Atkins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the, uh, you know, basically you're, you're getting rid of the carb-rich foods in the diet. So, you know, uh, bread, potatoes, pasta, desserts, sweets, beers. Um, and you're replacing those foods, those calories with fat and green leafy vegetables. So when I first did Atkins as an experiment, which I did when I was working on this first New York Times Magazine article, actually the science article that preceded it, I probably ate more green vegetables than ever because, you know, I would go to lunch and I would order, say, half a roast chicken or, you know, a piece of steak, and then I would ask them to hold the potatoes and give me a double order of vegetables or salad. Yeah, you know, this was the LA year. So I would go to the Gaucho Grill, which is where starving writers ate if they wanted meat. It's a Ar Argentine chain. Uh, yeah. yeah, right there and, in Santa Monica. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and my friends would get, you know, their skinless chicken breasts and their salads. And I would say, well, I'm, I'm on a diet and I'm eating health food. So I would get, they had an uh, appetizer that was melted uh, provolone cheese with pepperoni and then i'd get a steak but a huge order of vegetables or salad would come with it the idea is uh green vegetables have very few digestible carbohydrates and most of a you know a cup of broccoli has something like five grams of carbs 20 calories um so you can use as much green vegetables as you want but you get most of your the huge bulk of your calories from fat first and protein second. In my book, what I did is, and then carnivore, again, you don't eat the, the broccoli, right? <laughs> I, I'm unclear in carnivore whether they allow, because I don't follow it as much as I should if they, you know, if these people are eating butter or dairy products or. One of the things I did for the case for keto is I interviewed 150 odd uh, clinicians, maybe 140 some who practitioners uh, so about over 120 were physicians and the remainders were some chiropractors, nutritionists, dietitians, a dentist um, who had switched to our way of thinking. So they had transitioned and I wanted to know from them what their challenges, what their experience was and what the challenges were to them as physicians and the challenges to the patients. Um, because there are problems we all see with our you know, clients or friends. I get these through emails from readers you know, I did this and that happened. Often, you know, I only lost, I did exactly what you said, and I only lost 20 pounds and I'm 200 pounds overweight. What did I do wrong? Um, so I wanted to ask those questions to these physicians and kind of synthesize the knowledge that I got. And there are a lot of sort of common issues. And then there's a lot of issues that come down to, you know, on one level we do a self-experimentation, right? Um, the gist of it is, avoid carbs, lower your carbohydrate consumption as low as you can go, replace it with fat and see what happens. And now if you stall or plateau or you have a complication, unforeseen complication or even expected complication, what can you do to address that? And some people may eat too much fat, you know, the sort of, uh, the, you know, the butter and coffee thing. Uh, oh, bulletproof. Yeah, bulletproof coffee. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it is, the problem is if you're, if you're consuming 
liquid fat all day long. Um, maybe you're just continuing to store that fat. Or you're only burning the fat you're eating and not accessing or giving your body time to burn the fat you've stored. So one possibility could be that you're eating too much fat and that you should try and cut back. Uh, another possibility is you're not eating enough protein. That would be sort of the same thinking. So there's a school of thought now that uh, the whole secret is eating enough protein. I don't believe it in part because I went through periods in my life when I was eating, you know, the sort of classic low fat, high protein diet and had no effect on my weight. Um, so, and, you know, unfortunately our own anecdotal experience tends to drive many of the things we believe. The possibility that you're eating too much protein. This is something that a lot of physicians believe and certainly it would sync with you know, the dietary therapy for type 2 diabetes because you need insulin to deal with the protein. And the protein, as we said, stimulates some insulin secretion. So if you want to minimize your insulin levels, the higher protein diet isn't the way to go. But there's clearly physicians out there who say that they have great success telling their patients when they stall or plateau to, to eat less fat and more protein. So you go from eating chicken thighs to skinless chicken breasts, um, which I find an abomination, but it might work. Yeah, so there are a lot of ways. One of the things when I wrote the case for keto is I wanted to give people, I, I don't profess to have the answers. I profess to have some answers, but not the individual answer for everyone. I wanted to give them the tools about how to think about this. And originally the book was called How to Think About How to Eat and just how to think about low carb, high fat diets, how to think about I think properly about the why you might be suffering from overweight obesity type 2 diabetes and so the first step is clear which is you know i use a phrase from the 1825 book the most famous book ever written about food called the physiology of taste stayed in print for two almost 200 years now and the author guy named Jean Anthelme Briat Savarin, Frenchman, said if you want to lose weight, you need more or less rigid abstinence to what he called the uh, flowery and starchy aspects of the diet. In 1825, sugar consumption, sugar was still very expensive, so you only got sugar in pastries, not in Coca-Cola. Right. Anyway, so this is sort of the idea. Once you do more or less rigid abstinence to carbs, if you're doing rigid abstinence and you're still suffering from overweight or obesity, then you have to start playing with the other uh, aspects, experimenting with what works. And I tried to communicate, learn from these doctors what they thought worked for their patients and then communicate that to my readers. I love it. Well, I definitely recommend The Case for Keto. I loved the read. I'd love for you to share just a couple tips from what you uncovered with those doctors as if there were any other issues outside of cleaning up their carbohydrate intake and making sure that um, their, their fat intake wasn't too much. Was there anything else that you'd like to leave with anyone? I mean, you know, were there any, most like I, of it was ways to think about this that, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of the issues is how we approach it. So even when you look at the clinical trials, I'm often the people who like to criticize me, mostly young men on Twitter who, they can eat carbs, so they think everyone should be able to eat them without getting fat. You know, uh, there's a tendency in any scientific endeavor to look to criticize the experiments that don't agree with your preconceptions, your belief system. But um, when people do free living diet trials, so these are diet trials where you take your subjects in and you tell them how to eat and then you send them off into their lives and lock them away anywhere. You know, often the idea was you're putting people on a diet. So you're, you know, this is a way to eat, that this is our magic recipe. If you follow this magic recipe, it should work. And what they're not saying is just, look, you can't metabolize carbohydrates. This is, we talked about a little of this before we, you know, when you, your body tries to, when you eat carbs, it creates a hormonal milieu that makes you store fat, not your brother can eat them or your sister or your best friend. They don't, they have, they have a different hormonal response, but your response is fat storage. If you don't want to store fat, don't eat them. 
I wanted to communicate that message. And a lot of the, some of the therapy, the doctors I talked to said they think of what they do not as sort of a weight loss program or weight loss advice, but as sort of carbohydrate addiction uh, rehab center. You know, how can we get people off this belief that they have to eat bread and pasta and sweets to be happy? You know, I used to be a smoker and I used to think I needed to smoke cigarettes to be happy. It turns out I didn't. <laughs> Took me about two years to get to that point. But the other thing uh, that I really liked was I have one chapter. Um, I start the chapters at the end of the book with sort of uh, good li lines from physicians that really wrap things up. And one of them was from a, uh, a spine surgeon in Ohio, a, a woman named Carrie Doulis, who used to work for uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. And Carrie said, this isn't the religion, it's just about how the way she feels. And Carrie is, you know, uh, she was obese. She is a type one diabetic. Um, she has to take some insulin, but she also realized over the years that she can, her body doesn't really tolerate animal products. When she eats them in any form, she doesn't feel well and she has complications. So she's ended up eating a vegan, ketogenic diet. It takes a lot of thought and a lot of work, but she does it because her body works properly when she doesn't eat animal products and she eats a keto diet. And so she, her weight is normal. She looks terrific. She feels good. She could do her job as a spine surgeon without wondering, worrying about wanting to fall asleep in the middle of a surgery in the afternoon. I contrast her with a woman named Georgia Ede, who's a psychologist. Um, in Western Massachusetts, who used to work at Harvard and Smith College, and George's body doesn't seem to tolerate vegetable products, plant foods. And so Georgia has transitioned slowly over the years to eating a carnivore ketogenic diet because she has to for her to feel good. And this is what I mean by self-experimentation. You know, when things start to go wrong or you manifest symptoms, you think to yourself, could this be diet related? Like often with me, if something's worse in the evening than it is in the morning, I think, well, that's an interesting sign. That's something I ate over the course of the day. You know, if it's a rash or a whatever it is, a headache, something. And then what is it that I might have eaten? And a lot, one of the other messages is that you know, we're so careful about how we do things in life. We put in such effort into our sports activities, our jobs, our love life even, but the idea that we should work hard and practice and think deeply about a diet that will help us achieve an ideal weight and, you know, a health is something that sort of somehow has escaped us in modern times. You know, every, you find I, even popular writers on eating like Michael Pollan more, you got to do it right. It takes a lot of thought. A vegan, to eat a vegan or vegetarian diet and do it correctly and healthfully and have it taste good takes an extraordinary amount of work and thought. And the longer you do it, the better you get at it, just like anything else in life. And the, you know, the message is that's what you have to do here. We can't just give in and expect, and especially when the food's available to give into or such, you know, again, to use a non-technical term, crap. Right. Um, that, uh, you know, it takes work. But the argument I'm making is if you do the work right, you can achieve sort of remarkable level of health and, you know, a healthy way by this process of avoiding, you know, more or less rigid abstinence to the carbohydrates in the diet. It's a practice. It's a journey. It's getting better at it and going deeper to find out what works for you. Yeah. A lot of the physicians I interviewed talked about going down the rabbit hole. And, um, and again, these were, you know, so they not only did they, 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 had, they had an interesting journey because it's almost always the same journey. Malcolm Gladwell kind of made fun of this 20 years ago in an article he wrote on, on obesity that he just didn't have some of the advantages I did. So he's a wonderful writer and thoughtful man, but he had come like two years too early. And he called it the conversion experience. And the conversion experience is you're getting fatter you're, and you 
are eating healthy, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, and maybe your patients are getting fatter and more diabetic, and despite you telling them exactly what they should do, because you know what the truth is, and if you're getting fatter yourself, you can't blame your patients anymore. You have to start questioning whether or not the advice you're giving and the advice you're following is correct. And so now you go on the internet or you go to the library and you start doing research and you try different dietary approaches. So many of the 120 physicians I interviewed had already passed through periods where they had been vegetarian or vegan because they thought that's going to solve it. And maybe for some of them it did, and those people I never interviewed, right? Yeah. They never took the next step, which was to get to the low carb world and keto and carnivore and but when they got there, and maybe for many of them, it didn't work, and so I never talked to those people. That's a selection bias inherent in the kind of journalism I'm doing in this book. But for a certain significant number, it worked. And now, so it works for them, they lose weight. Now they say, okay, their patients say, geez, Doc, you, you lost 40 pounds. Great. What'd you do? Yeah. What'd you do? And the guy <laughs> says, well, I hate to admit this. <laughs> Because, but I did keto or Atkins or protein mm -hmm. power or, you know, some version of paleo. And I look, the research is now out there. We know this is safe. This is the most well-studied diet in history. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is at least as healthy, if not healthier than any other low-fat, Mediterranean, all the rest. Okay, when it's compared, people do better. And there are now several hundred trials out there that are actually looking at ketogenic diets, low fat, di low carb diets for all kinds of, to see how beneficial they might be for virtually every disorder you can imagine. Because they, anecdotally, they seem to make people healthy. Um, anyway, so that's it. They, they say, look, this is what I did. I know it's safe because here are the papers, the meta-analyses that show how well heart disease risk factors improve despite this high animal products, saturated fat diet. And you could try it. Yeah. I'm happy to, you know, what, one of the reasons I wrote these books is because some physicians still say, oh, you can't do that. Or if you want to do that, you're on your own. Or their patients come in and they say, the doctor says to the patient, geez, you look great. What happened? And the patient says, well, I hate to admit this, but I did keto. And the doctor says, well, I can't consonance that. That's, that's too dangerous. Hey, you can't do that. Like I could prescribe bariatric surgery where you have your GI tract, <laughs> you know, reassembled by a surgeon with a 25% complication risk, but God forbid you should eat a keto diet. You're killing yourself. So what I want, I wrote a book where I wanted doctors to say, look, okay, this guy's making the case for keto. I think keto is bullshit. I'm open-minded and, 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 you know, intellectually honest. So I'm going to read the case for keto and see if this guy makes any sense. And I'm hoping that I could convince them that when their patient comes in, they'll say, you know, well, look, I'm skeptical about this keto thing. Let's keep a check. Let's measure your lipids. Take, you know, have you come in. Ideally, instead of once a year, let's come in every three months. And we'll do full panels on you to, to, to monitor your health. And maybe I can learn with you if you're willing to let me do that. And, you know, maybe we'll make progress. So that's kind of, that's, that's my ideal world rather I, than this sort of knee jerk, this is crap, you're killing yourself. Even though I know that the single greatest risk factor for every chronic disease is excess weight and you've taken rid of, you got rid of that. <laughs> right. You know? so. Well, I'm so thankful that you wrote this book because there are so many physicians that have gone through 14 years of training all of the fellowships and a ketogenic diet does seem really scary. So if anyone's mm -hmm. tuning in, they should, they should read your book and they should make a case to their doctor or, or if you are a physician, pick up the book. Well, that, and that's what hopefully, you know, my, in an ideal world, also patients, they'll read the book, they'll try it, it works for them and they'll buy the book and give it to their doctor and say, look, just read it. Yeah. Okay. And my argument is if your doctor doesn't have time to read a book by, well, you know, one right or wrong, I've become one of the most influential writers on nutrition in America. If you don't have time to read one book by this fellow, maybe you shouldn't be giving any nutrition advice at all.
Yeah. If you can't keep up with the current research, especially in your space, then it scares me at what type of recommendations you're making and how, how long ago they were taught to you. Yeah. Well, this is the thing often people say to me, well, you know, doctors only get like an hour of nutrition training in medical school. And I said, yeah, but if they got any more, they'd be even more dogmatic about knowing the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> that might have to be the sound bite for this one. <laughs> That's okay. good. Gary, thank you so much for your time. I'm I'm thrilled that you published this book. Again, another phenomenal read. And I'm gonna link all your books in the show notes. I'm curious what your hopes are. I, I think what is your hope for for fighting this fight, the health crises we have here in the United States? what's next? What are you making a case for next? Well, the book I'm writing now is uh, this sort of history of diabetes and diet. So it's how did until insulin is discovered 1921, diabetes is seen as kind of a carbohydrate intolerance disorder and the treatment that everyone knows works for type 2 diabetics, they didn't use the phrase at the time, um, is was called an animal diet. So it was basically a fatty meat and green vegetables that were <laughs> boiled three times to get all the carbs out of them. He had a lot of misconceptions, but that was basically the thinking and the medic by the, the leading authorities. Um, and then insulin's discovered. And suddenly it's a miracle treatment for young men and women with type 1 diabetes. It's, you know, it's a disease that kills them quickly and horribly, and with insulin therapy, they can stay alive. But now you need carbs to balance the insulin. So instead of telling people not to eat any carbs, now you're telling people to eat at least some. And then some physicians say, look, you know, our patients don't want to be on diets. Why don't we feed them, give them as much insulin as they need. Back then it was relatively inexpensive. So let them eat what they want. They're going to do it anyway. Let them eat what they want and we'll give them more and more carbs. This was called the liberal diet movement. And then by the 1930s, as insulin had been around for 10 years, physicians started realizing that they were dealing with a heart disease. And um, arteriosclerosis disorder, the complications of keeping, suddenly they could see the long-term complications of type one, of diabetes because their patients were now living long enough to get the complications. So young men and women whose lives were saved by insulin when they were in their early teens are now dying of heart disease and kidney failure and blindness and having their limbs amputated when they're in their late 20s or early 30s. They're still young men and women. And and then when the low fat movement builds up in the 1960s, suddenly the ADA starts recommending that diabetics should eat, should eat, people with diabetes should eat even more carbohydrates than the general public because they have the highest risk of heart disease. So their fat causes heart disease and you can't eat fat, you should eat carbs. They can't metabolize carbs without serious problems, but that's what they're told to eat anyway. So it's a wonderful, bizarre, horrible, tragic history. Uh, the book I'm writing is sort of a case study, this idea of the pathology of medical science, what all my books have been about. I can imagine having between 37 and 45 readers, but uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. The next book I want to write after that is about uh, this energy balance story that we talked about, how the obesity community embraced this idea that people get fat because they eat too much, and all the implications, how that infected all of medical, and to a great extent, a large part of medical science. I don't know what's going to happen here. You know, the advantage we have is that if you can convince your patients or your clients to avoid carbs and eat the right foods, you can make them healthy. But the right foods include animal products, most of the health and um, the belief that animal products are a major cause of climate change is driving a whole, you know, it's kind of movement on a, on a global scale to get people to eat plant-based diets. And even to the point that the media is hesitant to discuss anything involving low carb or ketogenic diets because they're seen as bad for the environment. 
And the assumption is based on this bad epidemiology that the mostly plant diet is best for people. So we have this belief system that the healthiest way to eat for the planet is the healthiest way to eat for you, which is also the healthiest way to eat for the animals. Uh, it may be true for the latter, but even that can be debated. Um, so anyway, I don't know where it's going. That, that, that's a very powerful movement. You know, we have a way of eating that we can tell people to do that'll make them healthier, which is a powerful phenomenon. But it's fighting this sort of mass movement against the consumption of animal products that, that's fueled by understandable fears and anxieties and beliefs. Uh, they may not all be right, though. And right. even if they are right, the other question is, do you eat for the environment or do you eat for your own health and figure out how to fix the environment in other areas? Right. Um, so I don't know how that's going to play out. The next 20 years, should my diet allow me to live that long, should will be interesting. Well, I always recommend the documentary Kiss the Ground if people have... Yeah if they're looking to understand carbon sequest sequestration yeah. of carbon back into the ground by roaming animals. I think that that's a really powerful documentary and it's, it is an uphill battle. I mean, I've definitely been censored when it comes to wanting to do a, a new segment around quote unquote healthy snacking and making recommendations for grass fed beef sticks and things like that. And they mm -hmm. don't want to, they don't want me to talk about that sometimes. And and it's it's hard it's definitely hard i think you know yeah, continue to write has, your books <laughs> you know the world has changed and every time you read an article about you know half some large proportion of oregon is burning as we film this and uh, you know authorities who may indeed be right blame it on climate change and suddenly you know fires in oregon affect the health of individuals all around the world who are trying to reverse obesity and diabetes who don't and don't want to pass it on to their children. Right. So the issues are complex. Um, they're typically oversimplified. I don't know what the answers are. I, I hope that we'll win um, because I think we're right. Right. But uh, it's, you know, these other forces at work are powerful and they're, they're motivated by the best of intentions. So. Right. Well, I'm so glad that you brought up even in our conversation about pregnancy and passing that down, gener mm -hmm. you know, that, that hormonal cascade and that milieu, if you will, uh, down to your children and, and them facing metabolic dysfunction and raising our kids drinking ju fruit juice for breakfast and cereals and pancakes and waffles. And I mean, I just, and that's definitely become a passion for me through both of my pregnancies and mm -hmm. telling people that it's okay to eat a moderately low carb diet when you're pregnant. And in fact, you gain on average 20 pounds less and have yeah. very healthy children. So I think, um, you know, the recommendations to meet a certain requirement of carbohydrates while pregnant or to feed your children juice because of vitamin C is definitely misinformation that I'm trying to break down as well. And so I just, I can't thank you enough for the books that you write and the work that you do. We're going to link everything in the show notes, but um, thank you so much for being here. Where can people follow along and um, find you? Well, Callian, thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, I can be, I have a website, garytalbs.com that I don't keep up. <laughs> enough and i tweet at at gary talbs and i always regret <laughs> go have fun reading all yeah. gary's tweets on twitter <laughs> we'll link them <laughs> in the show notes okay thank you kelly thanks for being here thank you for listening to be well by kelly please subscribe to the show on apple podcasts spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts Learn more at BeWellByKelly.com and follow me on Instagram at BeWellByKelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 